All right. So, uh, just as a brief reminder of uh, the uh, standard compressive sampling that I introduced yesterday, mainly to recall you the notations. So, we are interested in a, a vector x, which is in dimension capital N, which is S sparse, and it is acquired to only m uh, linear measurement, so it's given in the form of y, which is known, is a times x, a, of course, it is known as well. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, yesterday, uh, I, so uh, after introducing uh, the problem, I also gave you uh, three algorithms uh, and explained intuitively why they, they should work, but there was no theoretical result. So, today, I'm going to in fact, concentrate on some theoretical results. And there will be two parts. Let's see. <coughs> All right. So, two parts. Uh, so, one, recovery guarantees that are based on the concept of coherence. And, uh, second part, some recovery guarantees that are based on the more modern uh, concept of restricted isometry property. So, let's start with uh, the coherence. Um, <coughs> so, we assume that our matrix A has normalized colon, L2 normalized, so the uh, Euclidean norm of each entry is equal to 1. If that uh, is not the case, we can always pre-process A so that it becomes true. Um, and the uh, coherence is a measure, if you wish, of uh, the uh, orthogonality, almost orthogonality between columns. So it's the uh, inner product of colon I with colon J uh, that we look at that in, in magnitude, and we look at the uh, maximum of uh, all pairs I and J. Now, recall that this is uh, not a square matrix. If it was a square matrix, that would be zero for orthogonal matrices. Uh, but here, uh, it cannot be equal to zero. Uh, however, as a rule, uh, small currents are good, and we will see why. But as a rule, small currents are good for compressive sensing. Right. But there is a, a lower bound. Uh, which is called the Welsh bound. So given M and N, the coherence has to be larger than this quantity square root of M, N minus M over M times N minus 1. So uh, you are, and I, I actually am going to, to do that just at the end of this slide. I'm going to uh, do the proof of this, uh, this Welsh bound. Uh, but a couple of remarks. We, we think usually of N being large. So, if n is large, that asymptotically is like 1 over square root of m. Um, well, so that will come out actually out of the proof, but uh, square root of m uh, is a bound that is somehow achievable. Uh, if we put some constant here that is different than 1, say 2 over square root of m, we can find matrices uh, that have a small coherence of this type. That I'm not going to give an explicit example, but trust me on that. So now I want to, to show you how to obtain the Welsh bound. <coughs> and I'm going to go on the board for that. Just a minute. Here we go. So I have my matrix A. I'm going to form the gram matrix. Uh, so G, which will be um, A adjoint times A. So this is a matrix of size N times N. Okay. And what are the entries of, uh, of G, I, J? They will be A, I, inner product A, J, 
or AJ, you know, product AI, I'm not sure exactly which one it is. Uh, in the complex case, it's a little different, but it, it won't change too much here. So if I'm looking at the trace of G, so it's the sum of the diagonal elements, and the diagonal elements are equal to 1 because of the normalization of the columns. And there are n diagonal elements, so that's 1. So that's capital N. We're going to look also at the matrix that I'm going to call H, which will be A star times A. And now this matrix is of size sorry, A times A star. I want to look at a different matrix. is of size M times M. Okay, And I'm going to look similarly at the trace of H. So what I'm going to say is that it's trace of H times the identity, which is the uh, Frobenius inner product of H times the identity. Is it clear to everybody what the Frobenius inner product is? OK, so I guess that means yes. So it's an inner product. There is a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, so that will be less than the uh, for Binus norm of H, which will be trace of H star H, or H H star, it doesn't matter which way we write it, times square root of trace of the identity. So here we're talking about the identity of order M. All right, so this is, in fact, M, so times still square root of trace of H star H. So I'm going to look at this trace of H star H, what it is exactly. <coughs> I'm sorry? Yes. Thank you. All right, so trace of H star H is the trace of uh, so H star is equal to H, so it's A times A transpose times A times A transpose. And then I'm going to pass one A on the other side by the cyclicity of the trace. So A star A, A star A, which is a trace of, let's say, G star G. And so that is the uh, Frobenius norm of G squared. And the Frobenius norm, uh, there's another way to write it, which is the sum of all the elements of uh, j i j squared in magnitude. So you sum over all i and j from 1 to n. OK, you agree with me? Still here? Yeah. H star h. Yeah, but it's just I'm writing that H is A star, and H transpose is A star as well. OK? All right. So now the entries here of uh, J, well, there are different entries. So on the diagonal, we know it's 1. Of the diagonal, it's the inner product of two columns. And the inner product of two columns is less in absolute value than the uh, coherence. Right? The, the coherence was defined as the maximum of those inner products. So we have in this sum, we've got n. Then we've got, uh, so that's n times 1, the diagonal elements. <coughs> Then we've got n squared minus n other elements, which are all bounded from above by mu squared. Squared, because of the square. Yes. So now, use the fact that uh, say trace of G is equal to trace of H, right? So I, I started with the trace of G. I also look at the trace of H, but they are the same. 
because one is A star A, the other one is A A star. Uh, so <coughs> let me put a square so that I get, through, uh, get rid of the absolute value, and I obtain that so the trace of G is N. It also is the trace squared, N squared, also equal to the trace of H squared, which is here. So I will have an upper bound in the N, so less than M times, uh, so N <coughs> plus N squared minus N times mu squared. Does that look right? OK. So um, <coughs> is there's one here. One, two, no, and not one here. All right. <coughs> so if you simplify by N throughout, divide by M. Do I want to divide by M? I am not sure. Let's see. Uh, less than I squared everything. I know I'm prone to mistake, so you should you should look for them. So uh, that would be uh, right. Something looks strange. Let's see. Let's continue. Yeah, I divided by n, but uh, something. I don't know. Let's see. Well, no, I think it's okay. So we will get n of m minus one uh, larger than n minus one times mu squared. So mu squared is larger than. Uh, so that's n minus m over m <coughs> here divided by n minus 1. And I believe that is what we should obtain. Let's check. n minus m over m times n minus 1. Okay, so we have that as we need it. OK, so here's the justification of the Welsh bound. As you can see, it's not too complicated. If you look at the proof, uh, I said at some point, at equality is achieved only for equiangular tight frames. Well, where, does, I mean, where do we have inequalities here? We have an inequality in cauchy schwarz So you would have equality in cauchy schwarz if H is proportional to the identity. Uh, so that gives you tight fr that frame, or tight frame, in fact. And uh, <coughs> you have also another inequality here, which will occur if all the uh, entries J and J of the diagonal, which are the uh, you know, product of the columns, are all equal to mu. So a triangular in that case. Course, yes. Why is it called Welsh bound? <laughs> I would assume that because a guy called name Welsh has. Uh, <laughs> okay. I did not verify that a guy called Welsh has proved it first. Have you? Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, so it's called the Welsh bound. You can call it the lower bound for the uh, coherence if you prefer. All right, but. Now let's uh, continue with uh, conditions that will say that if the coherence is small, we can say something. Right? And the first thing that I guess I would also do the proof of this uh, is for orthogonal matching pursuit. Um, every S sparse vector will be recovered from Y which is equal to Ax in at most S iteration of OMP, provided that the coherence is smaller than something that decays as like 1 over S, so precisely 1 over 2S minus 1. And I think I want to do uh, that proof as well, so uh, let's hide that once more. <coughs> All right, so the, the goal here 
Remember that yesterday I said uh, there is a if and only if condition for the recovery of vectors supported on a, on a fixed uh, index set uh, by, uh, by OMP. Right? So if I s write S for the support of the vector X that I want to recover, the goal is to prove the exact recon recovery condition exact recovery condition, that means, so that was, well, that AS has to be injective, let's uh, leave that uh, on the side for now, but that also the maximum for J in S of A star R uh, J's entry has to be larger than something. So here, R is of the form A times Z with support of Z included in S. Right, so for every R of this form that I take, and I probably have to take it non-zero so that I can have the strict inequality here, has to be larger than A star or L for all L not in S, so in S bar. I wrote it as max of the S is strictly larger than max of the L uh, of the S bar yesterday, but oh, in fact two days ago. But this is what we have to prove. Okay. Uh, well, so let's write R <coughs> as a combination of the colon. So so Z is supported on, uh, on S, so it has entry ZJ uh, non-zero only uh, for J in S, and A times V will be uh, the sum of the ZJ times AJ, so this is a vector, okay? So now the maximum for J in S, so let, let's take, let K in S be such that, so uh, Z, uh, K is the maximum for J in S of ZJ. If you look back at my notes uh, from two days ago, I probably wrote Z for R and R for Z, but it shouldn't, shouldn't matter here. Um, <coughs> so um, the maximum uh, of J in S of A star R J will be larger than uh, the choice we make, uh, J equal K. So A star R K, and that will be, uh, so the sum, so it's, uh, it's A K R in a product, and that will be equal to the sum for J in S of Z J A J A K. So what we have in this sum, uh, there is a J when it will be equal to K, that will be equal to one, normalization of the current. And for the other J, not equal to K, this is small. So let's bound it from below by, so there is a term ZK. So I'm using the triangle inequality, okay? So let me write it in this way maybe. <coughs> okay, and so it's larger than ZK. Uh, so each of these terms in this sum is the inner product in absolute value smaller than, right, there's a negative sign, so I want to uh, bound this from above, so uh, smaller than mu, how many, well, and in fact, zj is less than zk, because k was chosen as, a, as to maximize that, and how many terms in the sum, s minus one. Okay, so I can write that as zk factor of one minus s minus one times mu. <coughs> so that is 
what I want to do, again, is to, to prove that this is true. I'm first proving that the left-hand side is large, then I'm going to prove that the right-hand side is small. And proving that the right-hand side is small, in fact, is uh, even easier. So for L, uh, not in S, if I'm looking at A star R on L, it is A L in a product R. So it is the sum for J in S of Z J A J with in a product A L. And that will be smaller by the triangle inequality. So sum for J in S. I really don't need to write this down, but J is in S and L is not in S, so of course those two indices are different. So this is smaller than mu. Uh, so smaller than mu, smaller than ZJ, is smaller than uh, ZK. And how many terms in the sum? I have S terms in the sum. So we'll be done if that part is larger than this part. Right. So we'll be done if. Uh, so let me simplify by zk right away. So 1 minus s minus 1 over mu is uh, strictly larger than strictly larger than uh, s times mu. <coughs> what if you So this is a 1. This is minus s minus 1 times mu has to be larger than s times mu. So 2s minus 1 multiplied by mu has to be larger than 1, smaller, in fact. Why is uh, Yeah, no, that's fine. So 2s minus 1 times mu has to be smaller than 1. And so we want mu to be, right, so we don't see that, but it's up there, smaller than 2s minus 1. Okay. Uh, is somebody still writing something from the board? Yes. Is everybody, everybody finished writing now? Okay, good. Let's, uh, no, well, actually, it's on, so this is not what I want to do. So that was also going to matching pursuit. I also want to look at uh, L1 minimization. And we'll have the same kind of results. Every s sparse vector will be recovered only from y equal ax via basis pursuit, another name for L1 minimization, uh, provided the same condition on the coherent hold. So who asked yesterday this question about uh, y? So uh, here is a statement, and I'm going to explain that to you as well. In fact, it's not a coincidence that you have the exact same uh, condition for both of them. In fact, the exact recovery condition from here, it's on the board uh, that's behind, can be rephrased as this condition. I'm going to show you how. And in fact, this implies a uh, null space property. And the null space property is an if and only if condition for recovery by basis pursuit, whereas the exact recovery condition was an if and only if condition for recovery by OMP. So again, let me just take a few minutes to explain this last bullet. And that shouldn't take long.
So first of all, let's rephrase maybe the exact recovery condition here. Uh, right. As so the maximum of the S is an infinity norm of uh, so the submatrix A S. So A sub S is the submatrix uh, for which you keep only the colon indexed by S. Then you take the transpose <coughs> times R. The infinity norm here has to be uh, so E R C is equivalent to, so that's just a rephrasing of these parts. Uh, S, S bar, again, S bar is my notation for the complementary of S. And I want that to be true for all uh, R to be of the form A times Z, where Z is supported on S. I can also write it that as A S times, so I'm hesitant to call it Z again, but I'm going to call it Z again. But notice that this has, uh, well, this was a vector of full size N. This is a vector of size little s. Okay, so I want that A star S times A S Z is strictly larger than A. S bar star, so it's A S Z infinity for all Z in R S. And uh, in fact, I'm going to call that vector something else. Um, let's say U. So I'm going to take U to be uh, A S star A S times Z. Right, so that is U here. That will be A S transpose. Uh, so A S, and then what is Z uh, as a function of U is the inverse of that. A S transpose A S inverse times U. Infinity norm. And well, I can assume that this is indeed an invertible matrix. So l notice first that it has the shape of uh, so M rows S colon with S smaller than, than M. So this is a, a small square matrix of size S times S. And this one has chances to be invertible. In fact, one of the conditions was that AS is injective, which is the same as saying that this is invertible. So when I'm going to define this in you know, implicitly, the condition AS is injective is in there. That happens to be uh, the pseudo inverse transpose uh, of the vector U. Uh, so the pseudo inverse in that case is uh, defined as so AS dagger would be so. AS transpose AS inverse times AS transpose. And you notice that this is an inverse of AS from the left, because if you multiply by AS on the right, it's the inverse of something times this same matrix is the identity. OK, so what I'm writing here is that a certain matrix applied to U in L infinity norm as norm uh, less than the norm of U in infinity norm for all for all U. In fact, I'm writing that the uh, operator norm of this matrix <coughs> is strictly less than one. And uh, the condition, the way I wrote it, was not exactly the same. Uh, but the infinity, the operator norm uh, for the L infinity metric and the uh, L operator norm for the L1 metric are, are related. And one norm is the norm of, of the transpose 
of the matrix of the other one by duality. So in fact, this is the same as saying that the operator norm from L1 to L1 of the uh, tron oh, that is not what I should have written. Why is uh, There's no other choice, there was nothing dry. All right. So it was AS bar times AS dagger transpose. Okay, so AS dagger times AS bar is less than one in infinity norm. All right, so this is uh, another way of expressing the uh, uh, exact recovery condition. And that's one part of the statement that I wanted to show you. The other part is that implies the null space property on S. So, All right, so that should be enough here. <coughs> Prove the null space property. So on on S, that means that I want to look at uh, a vector v in the null space of A, and I want to say that the L1 norm of v on S is strictly less than the L1 norm of v on S bar. And that was the null space property. Now. Uh, we're going to use at some point that AS dagger is a right inverse uh, for AS or left inverse. So this is the identity on S. So you can simply write this as it is. Right? Now, the fact that V is in the null space of A translates into the fact that A, you know, VS plus A of V S bar equal to zero. So that's supported on S. You can write it as well. And that's supported on S bar in this way with the understanding that sometimes V S means a vector of full dimension. Sometimes just I consider the entry uh, on S. But that means that A S V S is the opposite of AS VS bar. When I take the norm, this negative sign will go away. So I would get AS dagger AS bar times VS bar. And that will be less than the operator norm here times VS bar and this operator norm for L1 to L1. And that precisely is uh, what we've uh, shown is less than one under the strictly less than one under the exact recovery condition. So that will be strictly less than V S bar L1 norm. With so the proviso that this is non zero, but that would be true if, if this is non zero, I will just have to be careful with the strict inequality signs. Uh, I wasn't very careful, but you can uh, can check all of those things. All right, so <coughs> Under the uh, exact recovery condition, the null space property on S is satisfied. And that means, again, that recovery by OMP implies recovery uh, by uh, L1 minimization. And when I say recovery, I mean recovery of all S sparse vector. In fact, from that, all vectors supported on S. But it, I'm not saying that if you know, one individual vector is recovered by OMP, it has to be recovered by uh, L1 minimization for just one individual vector. All right. Actually, I'm not sure I even asked myself this question before, but uh, this is you know, not what I'm saying. I was talking about recovery of every sparse vector. OK. Uh, 
think I was a bit slow on that, so let me uh, increase the pace a little bit, meaning doing less proofs. Um, all right, I, I lost uh, my. <laughs> all right, so here's the situation that was in about 2004 uh, with a condition based on coherence. Uh, so to sum up, the coherence condition that uh, we need to guarantee a sparse recovery are of the following type. The coherence has to be smaller than something over S. However, the Welsh bound tells you, you know, roughly when N is large enough that M is a larger than some other constant, not the same constant, over square root of M. So if you want to fulfill both of them simultaneously, you need this to be smaller than that, or in other words, m has to be larger than some constant times s squared. Right? So as any argument based on, on coherence, we will necessitate a number of measurements scaling quadratically in s. But we were after a minimal number of measurements, which was 2s in the ideal situation, uh, in the non-ideal situation. We don't want it to be, you know, much larger than s, and s squared is in fact uh, too large. So this is uh, what can be called the quadratic barrier, and we want to break that. We want to find matrices of size m times n with n smaller than s squared that guarantee uh, s sparse recovery uh, from y equal a x. I guess it's a good time because I'm going to go to an another concept. Is it a good time to make the break now? All right. So I give a few minutes. Um, so restricted isometry, restricted isometry property. Right? So uh, is uh, the fact that we have small restricted isometry constant for a good regime of parameter n, m, and s. But what are the restricted isometry constants? I think Stephen Wright introduced them yesterday. Uh, so uh, it's a constant depending on the matrix A and also of the order, uh, the sparsity uh, parameter that you consider. Uh, so delta S will be the smallest constant so that AZ, if you look at that in L2 norm squared for every S sparse vector Z, it doesn't deviate too much from the L2 norm of z squared. So there's a factor of delta uh, z squared that is important there. All right, so um, do I have something else? OK, the alternative form, and I guess I'm going to show you as well how it comes into play, uh, is that delta s is the maximum of the whole subset of size at most s of a s star a s minus the identity that taken uh, in operator norm from L2 to N2. So if you have a small restricted isometry constant, it means that AS star AS is close to the identity. So that, well, AS star is close, AS star AS is close to an isometry. That AS is close to an isometry that you can see uh, from here as well. Uh, so. Uh, in a sense, the restricted isometry constant uh, measure how every set of S columns behave like an orthonormal system, whereas in the uh, coherence case, we measure how any two pairs of, of, uh, of columns look ortho orthogonal, orthonormal, because we assume uh, L1 no normalization of the uh, columns. Here, we don't actually assume L1 normalization of the column, but if you take uh, z to be one of the uh, basis vector, this is the uh, corresponding column in L2 norm square, so it's not, you know, not far away from having a unit norm. Uh, all right, so let me show you quickly this uh, alternative form because I actually think it's uh, maybe a nicer form to use in practice. So delta s will be the smallest delta such that, OK, so if I rewrite this condition over there as a z l2 norm squared minus z l2 norm squared, uh, I want that to be less than delta norm of z squared in, a <coughs> in, 
in modulus or in absolute value in this case. Okay, so for all Z S for all S sparse Z. All right, and in fact that I can write as A Z A Z minus in a product of Z with Z. Okay. I want that to be true for all S bar Z. So in other words, all uh, S of size at most S and all Z supported on S. <coughs> and if Z is supported on S, I can again restrict A, S, uh, A to uh, A, S as a submatrix indexed by the colon indexed by S. Now, I can use duality here to write this as A S star A S times Z inner product Z, and then I'm going to subtract that as well from the inner product. So that will be minus the identity here. So you want that to be true for all Z supported on S and for all S of size little s, or at most little s. So if you look at this, this is a Hermitian matrix, alpha joint, and the maximum. Uh, so I want that to be smaller than uh, delta z squared. Maybe you can normalize z to have norm 1 if, if you want, and then that the maximum of all z. Uh, which is normalized is the uh, operator norm of this matrix from L2 to L2. Okay, so and then what is the smallest delta S such that this will be true? Uh, well, here that tells me that I want AS uh, minus identity in operator norm to be less than delta. What is the smallest delta for which that will be satisfied for all S? It's exactly what I wrote. Right, uh, and just one more comment. All right, so I, I actually won't do the proof here, uh, but it's a simple observation. If you take a, a matrix with L2 normalized colon, and then you write what this matrix is, you know, when S, take S to just consist of two elements, I and J. If you write what this matrix is with the fact that the columns are normalized, you would have zero on the diagonal, and you would have of the diagonal the inner product AI, AJ, and AJ, AI, and the eigenvalues. You can calculate those, what, what they will be. Basically, will be the, abs the uh, modulus of AI, AJ, and the opposite. So the trace is zero. And what is uh, you know the maximum of a uh, all S of size 2 of that, of AI in a product AJ in modulus, it's a coherence. So delta 2 is a coherence. Right? But that you know, echoes what I said before, that in uh, here we're measuring how any set of S columns behaves like an orthonormal system, or as a coherence measured how every two, every set of two, uh, colons behave like an orthonormal system. All right, so uh, we keep this alternative form in mind. And just like the coherent, suitable compressive sensing matrices have small restricted isometry uh, constant. Now, that will happen that delta S is smaller than some prescribed threshold with high probability when we take a random matrix, provided the number of measurements of, is of the order a constant depending on delta star times s times log the n over s. This part is, you know, establishing this will come tomorrow. So we accept it for now. We're going to say just in a few slides that under condition of this type, we have exact recovery by s sparse recovery by many algorithm. And that happens with this number of measurements. Right, so we are will be much smaller than the linear scaling in S. Uh, just one word on the scaling in this, in this bound here. This constant is basically something of uh, the square of this threshold. 
typically for random matrices, and in fact, this is optimal. The scaling is optimal. Scaling in delta square. Let's not spend too much time on that. And this is, I would say, the uh, most important slide of the uh, of my lectures. Uh, exact recovery by L1 minimization under restricted isometry property. Under the condition, let's say, that delta 2s is less than 1 so This is not the best condition, but it's uh, the simplest derivation. So uh, yesterday, Stephen Wright showed you some argument that was based on um, some property uh, that he did not prove. Now, I haven't proved yet that the restricted isometry constant can be made small. I will do that tomorrow. But if you accept this, uh, here you have uh, another self-contained proof. So what I want to do is uh, prove the null space property, because I know it's an if, if and only if condition. Right? So for the null space property, maybe I should write a little bit what my objective is. So I said that when we want to prove the null space property, we want to prove that for all uh, vector in the null space of A and for all S of size at most S, we want that Vs in L1 norm less than Vs bar in L1 norm. So that's one way to formulate it. Another way which will be useful here is you know, look at this inequality, possibly add Vs to both sides in L1 norm. Right? If you add Vs to both sides in L1 norm, this becomes the L1 norm of the vector V at the whole. And then you've got a factor 2 here. Pass it on the other side. That's another way to express it. Right. And this is the, the one I'm going to, uh, to obtain. Right. So take a vector v in the null space. This is my objective. Now, I wanted to prove it for every index set of size s. But I might as well take the index set that contains the s larger centuries of v. Because if, if I do that, all the other ones will be, will be small. So uh, I take s to be s0. Uh, the uh, index set uh, of largest ab absolute entries of V. And also, I, I will keep on uh, grouping uh, the indices into uh, groups of size S according to the uh, decreasing magnitude of the entries of V. Right. So S0 contains the S largest, S1 contains the next S largest, S2 contains the next S largest, etc. Okay, so. Um, it is usually hard to work with the uh, L1 norm here. So let's start with the L2 norm of V on S0 uh, and L2 norm squared. So by the new restricted isometry property, that will be less than 1 over 1 minus is delta S, because this is S sparse that I'm going to use 2S. So the, is, if it's S sparse, it's 2S sparse times the L2 norm squared of, of this element here. Now, V is in the null space. So A of V S0 equals the opposite of A of V on the uh, complementary of S0. Right? And the complementary of S0 is S1, union S2, union S3, etc. OK, so um, maybe uh, I skipped a step here. But this is the inner product of A of V S0 with uh, A of the sum of the uh, negative V S k. And so I'm using linearity to write it in exactly this form. OK. Now, why is this next step true? Because here I've got A star A applied to Vs0, and then in a product, negative Vsk. But Vs0 and Vsk are disjointly supported. S0 and Sk don't have the same support. So I can also say A star A minus the identity. Right. And when I use this uh, representation uh, of the restricted isometry constant, so Cauchy-Schwarz first, and then uh, the operator norm of, of the, uh, what I would get uh, as the operator here, it will have an operator norm less than delta 2s. Right. So delta 2s for the operator norm, Vs0 and Vsk. And then there is a sum of all that. Okay. So what we'll do, we'll simplify by one of the Vs0 in L2 norm in both sides. 
And then we have to deal with this sum for k larger than 1 of Bsk in L2 now. And uh, this is uh, a classical argument here that V, so I've got Sk contains so decreasing entries of V and Sk minus 1. So let me put Sk minus 1 and Sk here, right? That shows you that the entries on Sk are smaller than the entry on Sk minus 1 in modulus. Now, I want to look at the L2 norm of Vsk here. Now, if I look at the L2 norm, I take somehow an average. So if I look at Vsk L2 norm squared, uh, so that's the sum of the Vj squared when j is in Sk. If I average that, so I take 1 over s, so the average will be smaller than the value that I have here, so which is uh, with the square. Let me remove the square, take the square root here. So this average is smaller than the, the value here. And what about uh, Vsk minus 1? If I take the average of the, uh, not the square of the entries, but the entries in absolute values, so the entries in absolute value. If I add them um, all together, I've got Vsk minus 1 in L1 norm. And then I average. I take 1 over s. This is what I have. And this average here is larger than what I have here. Right? So that the average here was smaller than, than this entry or that entry. The average here was larger. So if you look what I wrote and simplify by square root of s, I wrote that Vsk in L2 norm is smaller than 1 over square root of s times Vsk minus 1 in L1 norm. All right, so this is this crucial observation. All right, so now, based on this observation, I have, you know, after simplification by Vs0 and L2 norm, I have delta 2s, 1 over minus delta 2s. I will have the square root of s coming out. And what I have would be sum for k larger than 1 of Vsk minus 1 in L1 norm. So the L1 norm of V on S0, then the L1 norm of V on S1, and et cetera, et cetera. And they all add up to something which is the L1 norm of V, or in fact smaller because we're missing the, the, last, uh, the last index set possibly. But this is what we arrive at, OK? Now, we can compare the L. We have you know, almost something like, like we want, except that we have an L2 norm here. But for the L1 norm of a vector with effectively only S entries, I can compare the L1 norm with the L2 norm. There will be a square root of the number of entries coming into play. And that will simplify with this 1 over square root of s. So I arrive at this condition. So what do I want? I want that with uh, this constant being smaller than 1 half. Well, if you take delta 2s small enough, you can make this constant less than 1 half. If you look exactly what it should be for this constant to be less than one half, it's uh, delta 2s less than one third, one third over two third. Okay. Any question on this proof? I think it's a really important part of uh, of, of my mini course, so I at least want you to to know this one. Okay, so I guess no questions, uh, so 10, 10, 10 minutes. All right, so I, I will skip through that uh, quite quickly. Uh, but yes, two days ago I said, well, I, I won't talk too much about you know, realistic situation where you have to take into account defect with uh, of sparsity defect and measurement error, but let me just make a smaller party about that. So stability and robustness of the, uh, of the algorithm. So you, the objective that we really you know, want is that for every uh, vector x, not necessarily s sparse, uh, 
Oh, so we want an algorithm, a recovery algorithm, and a good m measurement matrix so that the following guarantee holds, that the x minus the reconstruction from ax plus a measurement error in some norm, p, p will be between 1 and 2, is bounded by a term uh, that is equal to 0 if x is as sparse. So this is the distance to sparse vector in L1. Uh, on Friday, we'll understand why we insist on, on having L1 here. And then a term that will be equal to 0 if the measurement error is actually equal to 0. So we suppose that we have a bound on the measurement error, eta. And um, if we do L1 minimization, we won't minimize the L1 norm subject to a, a constraint AZ equal Y, because Y is not exactly equal to AX. So, but the constraints will be that AZ minus Y is less than eta in, well, L2 norm in this case. We can take other norms if we want to. Okay, so we have those two terms, stability and robustness. There are some constants in front, and actually they do depend on S. Um, let's not, maybe not look at the case of general P, but if I take P equal 1, uh, I'm measuring the reconstruction error in L1. I want to uh, compare it with the distance to sparsity in L1. And in fact, here that coefficient will go away. It will be S to the power 0. And here we would have square root of S if I take P equal 1. If I take P equal 2, then I'm measuring the reconstruction error in L2. And I will compare it with uh, the L2 norm of the, uh, of the uh, measurement error. And this factor of s will disappear. This factor of s will be 1 over square root of s in this case. And in between, it's interpolation, uh, linear interpolation in, in 1 over p uh, for the exponent. All right? So this is basically the objective that, that, that we are targeting. And in fact, though it will be a bit long to explain why we want those factors. but Basically, we cannot do better. Right. And uh, so suppose that, that this holds for every x, every e. If I take, for example, x, I will call it v. I think of v as something in the null space, although it won't be in the null space. Uh, e, I can make every choice that I want. I would take minus a v. And eta, well, the norm of that. So ax plus e will be 0, what you do for for uh, the minimization will give you 0 here. So you have v in LP norm will have to be less than something. So the distance to sparse vector will be v on any complementary of a set of size s, an L1 norm. And that will be so the L2 norm of v. Now, that, you know, for example, if you take v in the null space of A, that goes away. So we're comparing the norm of, of, of v. Suppose we take p equal 1 uh, to the norm of v on s bar, which was actually another way of seeing the null space property. Or you can say, if you want, the norm of v on s will be smaller than that. So if rho is less than 1, you see the null space property again. So um, in fact, uh, robust null space property is somehow a necessary and sufficient condition for robust recovery by L1 minimization. So, OK, I, I think I, I wrote too, too many details here. But basically, I'm going to ask the L2, the norm of V uh, for any V you know, in the null space. Uh, not in the null space, precisely not in the null space. It's just that if it's in the null space, that term goes away. Uh, and then I'm going to ask for the L2, L2 norm of V on S to be strict less than some rho, which has to be less than 1 uh, with the proper factor times the uh, L1 norm of V on S bar. So if you take S, so Q equal 1, you obtain the null space property that I've mentioned before, almost, uh, except that rho is restricted less than 1. OK, I, I let some freedom for, for the choice of, of, uh, of the norm here. So that will be the LQ robust null space property. Why is it? Uh, important, well, because if you want those guarantees from the slides before, that has to happen. Also, uh, it implies the LQ robust null space property implies 
uh, uh, an estimate of this type for every z and x. You know, no, no condition on those. But if x is a vector you want to recover and z is the L1 minimization, then the norm of z in L1 normal is less than that norm, so that term is negative. And then you obtain so the distance to sparse vector here and here something that will be that you can bound by the uh, measurement error in some norm. So it is necessary. It is also sufficient for uh, the guarantee, the stable and robust guarantee that we want. In fact, it, it gives a little bit more. And in fact, when you take so Q, there should be a Q somewhere. If you take Q equal 1, this is exactly equivalent to uh, the robust new space property. All right, so but mainly I want to tell you that, that this thing is basically the right tool. That's what you want to go after. Uh, and usually you prove restricted isometry property implies uh, L2 robust null space property. In fact, if you have the L2 robust null space property, the other one with indices smaller will also be true. All right. So, and yeah, this will happen with when delta S is smaller than, so the best threshold is 1 over square root of 2. A little, there, there was some, um, a bit of history of, you know, the uh, proof that I showed you before. Uh, necessitated delta 2s less than one third, if I remember correctly. Uh, and that was not the best threshold. And then there, there was some improvement and improvement and improvement. I was part of, of some of those. And now it has been increased to, uh, by uh, Tony K and other people, uh, delta 2s less than 1 over square root of 2. And you cannot do better. So the story is closed now for, for this. All right, so iterative hustle shoulding. All right, so I, I, have, I have three minutes, but I can do the proof uh, in three minutes. It's really a simple proof as well. Another thing that I would like you to, to remember. All right, iterative hustle shoulding, I introduced it yesterday, but let's look again what it is. Um, Xn plus 1, the iteration at n plus 1 uh, is, so you form Xn plus A star applied to the residual. And uh, you have threshold. You keep the s largest entries uh, of that vector. Right, and so you produce this sequence. Uh, I promised you yes, uh, two days ago uh, a more intuitive way of understanding why this should work. Well, take a star. So y is ax. So you've got a star a applied to x minus xn. Now a star a will be applied to a sparse vector, a 2s sparse vector, as a matter of fact, and then restricted to a sparse set as well. And in this case, A star A behaves like the identity. So what you have here is something that should be close to xn plus x minus xn, in other words, 2x. And so uh, maybe an intuitive way to see why it should work. Uh, and so our thresholding for suit, you do a, a also a an orthogonal projection step. Uh, so what I want to do is to explain you why this algorithm converge. So the limit when n goes to infinity will be the original x when delta 3s less than 1 half. We'll see what exactly the condition should be. x n plus 1 is hs of something. But when you take the s largest entries, it's taking the best s sparse approximation to a vector. Right? So is the best s sparse approximation to, uh, so what was the vector inside HS? It was Xn plus A star applied to Y minus AXN. I'm going to work in the case where Y is exactly AX. So let me write it in this way. Right? 
So that, that's the definition of Xn plus 1. So better s sparse approximation, so it's better than every other s sparse approximation. So let's say is a better s sparse approximation to that vector than x is. So uh, if I take xn plus a star a x minus xn, so minus xn plus 1 in L2 norm squared, so that will be smaller than xn plus a star a x minus xn, so minus x in L2 norm squared. So what I wrote is that xn plus 1 is a better approximation to that vector than, than x is. Right. So I, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to introduce x and remove it from here so that uh, <laughs> it's finished. <laughs> All right. So that term is exactly the same as this one. So if I expand the square, I would have the square here that would simplify with that one. I would have the other square, x minus xn plus 1 squared. And we'll have a double inner product. Uh, so the inner product of that quantity with this one, which I'm going to pass on the other side. So I need to be a little careful with the signs. But in fact, it doesn't matter. We're going to take absolute values. So. I would have, let's say, x minus xn plus 1 is one part of the inner product. And then I would have, so the opposite of that. But again, this is x minus xn uh, so uh, with multiplied by a star a and also multi minus, minus the identity. So xn, uh, so x minus xn comes with the, uh, a negative sign from here. So what is it exactly? So if I take the negative sign into account, a minus a, or let me write, a star a minus the identity. Uh, and then that should be xn minus x, I guess. It doesn't matter if I make a, a mistake in the signs. Now, note that when I do that, uh, so this is applied to a 2s sparse vector, and a star. I think of putting it here as well, if you want, it again, apply to a 2s sparse vector. Of all the support, the common support at size 3s, there's the support of s, the support of xn, and the support of sn plus 1. Right? So I can put some t, where t is a union of three supports, but the size of t is at most 3s. Now I'm going to use cauchy schwarz And then the norm here, but the norm here, I'm going to have this operator applied to xn minus x. And then that will be smaller than the operator norm from L2 to L2 times this quantity here. OK, so let's simply, you see that I have got x minus xn plus 1 in L2 norm on one side and also on the other side. I can simplify to get x minus xn plus 1 in L2 norm less than 2. So when this is gone and this is bounding above by delta 3s, what's left is x minus xn in L2 norm. So I think you see the end of it. I'm going to call that rho, and that will be less than 1 when delta 3s is less than 1 half, and I have a geometric decay of x minus xn. Right, so x minus xn will be less than rho to the power n x minus x0, which really we start with x0 to be equal to, to 0. And we obtain this estimate. n goes to infinity. That goes to 0. So the limit of xn is exactly x when n goes to infinity. Well, again, I think you would agree, I hope, that this is a, a simple argument uh, 
to uh, prove the success of uh, our thresholding pursuit. So I'm about done. I just want to see if I want to tell you something that would be important for <coughs> Tomorrow, I don't think so. Uh, stable, <coughs> stability and robustness, they do hold. Uh, the slides, by the way, they are available as well. Instead of ws1.pdf, it's ws2, winter school, lecture two, not PDF, same password. Uh, also going to matching pursuit. The only thing I want to tell you here is that similar type of result can be obtained, but it's not in S iteration. It's not possible to obtain uh, the convergence of OMP in exactly S iteration if you want to do S sparse recovery, not under uh, the optimal regime of parameters. But it is possible to do it in a constant number times S iteration. That's the recent results. Uh, maybe I will finish with that so we can write explicitly what the constants are but they're, 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 they're not important. The proof itself is, uh, so it's included in our book. It's uh, taken from the original proof. So it's taken from the original proof of Tong Zhang, and it, it's very complicated and very unnatural. There has been a recent proof by uh, Cohen, Daman, and Devon, which is much simpler. Still, so, that leads us to the problem session. If you have an ID to, well, it's been proved twice already, so it's just an exercise, right? To maybe get a, a, a more natural proof of the success of OMP in CS iteration. When I say natural, I mean something that, you know, you have the intuition, you know the step that needs to be done, and you can do it on the board. Not something that, you know, you can follow and it makes sense, but if you're asked on the spot to do it again, you cannot do it. So that's, that's what I call natural. All right, so uh, that leads to the problem session. And again, tomorrow, I will look at random matrices and establish that they do satisfy the restricted isometry property, RIP. Thanks for the attention. <laughs>